Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus. To him be the glory always. Amen. I invite you to take out your notes and follow along or take out your Bibles and and take notes directly in your Bibles this morning. We pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you so much for your word that would speak to us today. Fill us with uh, your presence and power, the victory that you have won in the name of Jesus. Amen. We're in a series on the battles within, and we're looking at some of the struggles that we go through, that we face in this life, and yet it's nothing new. Lots of people in the Bible face all kinds of of inner battles. So if we take time to look at their life and experience, we can learn how they dealt with them and learn a little bit about the inner battles we face. Life can be overwhelming. (laughs) Sometimes it feels as if everything that can go wrong goes wrong and then some. You know, we struggle, maybe we're struggling to make ends meet in the midst of that, our car breaks down or something and our house breaks or someone gets sick and I just, the bills pile up, it's just too much, just too much, it's overwhelming. Or maybe a crisis happens and life spins out of control. It feels like it's just too much to handle and and we don't know what to do. Or maybe it's not as dramatic as all that. Maybe it's just a bunch of little things that add up to big things. And uh, it could be something like uh, the cost of living. And we can make it before, but now we we just don't know how we can do it. I know personally my prayer list has really grown lately because I know a lot of people who are sick or in the hospital. I've seen lives lately that are turned upside down. In fact, if you spend too much time watching the news lately, you're probably wondering, why hasn't Jesus come back? Uh, And you just can't help get depressed. uh, A lot of people I talk to will say things like, I I just feel overwhelmed right now. I, I don't know what to do. Beloved, you're not alone. Jehoshaphat experienced much of the same thing. And, and one of the things that we can learn from looking at his experiences is how to talk to God about it and how to live in the victory that God has won for us. And so today, that's why I'm inviting you to take notes directly in your Bibles. Now, uh, three nations have gathered to come against Jehoshaphat and Judah. And it's such a big army that there's no way they can, they can stand up against them. I mean, sure, maybe if there was one, they could, they could probably win, but, but not three. Jehoshaphat knew this, and so the first thing he did was acknowledge what he was going through. Acknowledge what you're going through. Verse 3, 2 Chronicles 20, verse 3, Jehoshaphat was afraid. Now, Jehoshaphat was a godly king. He, he loved the Lord. He became king at the age of 35, same age as me, King at 35, and he reigned for 25 years. And, and he, he made a lot, of, well, he made some mistakes along the way, but he, he always held on to his faith. He always trusted God. And now, when this big problem comes, he knows exactly what to do. And the first thing he does is he doesn't hide his fear. He acknowledges his fear. Second, don't try to go it alone. Uh, it says in verse, next verse, Jehoshaphat was afraid. And he turned his attention to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. So Judah gathered together to seek help from the Lord. They even came from all the cities of Judah to seek the Lord. And we often look toward God as a last option. We go to him when everything else has failed. And we say things like, well, nothing left to do but pray. And yet, Jehoshaphat knew prayer was the first thing to do. He immediately turned his fear to the Lord because he knew the battle was just too big for him. He was overwhelmed by it, and only God could help him. Peter said, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. God cares about what we're going through, and he wants to help. That's why Jesus came. But Jehoshaphat didn't just turn to God. He 
turned it to other believers as well. He proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah, and he invited other believers to walk with him through this struggle and seek the Lord with him. So, so don't try to go it alone. He shared his struggle with other believers. Now, beloved, it's really easy for us to want to withdraw in overwhelming battles. When we feel stressed out or afraid or alone, it can be really hard to do anything. We don't know what to do, and it's a struggle just to figure out anything beyond this very moment. And that's exactly why we need other believers to walk with us through these difficult times. Paul said in Galatians 6, bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. But it's also, this is also why it's important for us to notice others who are going through these inner struggles as well. Uh, and they may not know to ask for help. They may not know what to do themselves. And so we want to notice so that we can walk with them through their battles and, and we can join with them and help them uh, maybe pray and see God together which is what we want to do. We want to spend time in prayer and fasting. So all Judah gathers in the house of the Lord, and they join in prayer and fasting. And they're giving up food so that they can focus fully on the Lord, and they're trusting that God's going to supply all their nourishment in this time. Now, I'm not going to explain fasting to you. That's another sermon. But, but I want you to understand this is focused prayer, prayer with a purpose. One of the great prayers in the Bible. And so Jehoshaphat prays, and he begins as he confesses who God is. And he prays in verse 6, O Lord, the God of our fathers, are you not God in the heavens? Are you not ruler over all the kingdoms of the nations? Power and might are in your hands so that no one can stand against you. Now today we might pray like this. We might pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. In essence, that's exactly what Jehoshaphat is praying. He's acknowledging who God is, our Father in heaven. And he's acknowledging how great and powerful, you know, hallowed, great is your name. You are Lord of lords and King of kings. And then he goes on to give evidence of the might and goodness of the Lord. He says, did you not, O oh, our God, drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it to the descendants of Abraham, your friend forever? And by the way, these are rhetorical questions. The, the obvious answer is always yes. But today we might pray like this. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Yeah, that's what he's, he's doing. He's, he, this is, he's saying, this is the land you promised to give to your people, the children of Abraham, your friend. And uh, it was. So it was God's, since God promised, it was his will that they inherit this land. And, and so they were living out in God's will. And then, and then he reminds God of his promises. This is what he says. He reminded God of his promises. <laughs> this is what he said in verse 9. Should evil come upon us, the sword or judgment or pestilence or famine, we will stand before this house and before you, for your name is in this house, and cry to you in our distress, and you will hear and deliver us. God delights when we remind him of his promises. It means that we're in his word and we're believing that his word is true, that we trust what he says. Reminding God of his promises is a response of faith. God has given us over 7,000 promises in his word, just, just waiting for us to grab hold of one and pray in the midst of our struggles, for example. I, I, if you uh, feel overwhelmed, if you feel afraid, if you feel alone, and it's just difficult times, you may want to, to pray Joshua 1.9. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not tremble or be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. God has promised to be with us. He's promised in Hebrews 13, never will he leave us or forsake us. Uh, Matthew 20, uh, 28, Lo, I am with you all. 
always, even to the very end of the age, that we are never alone. He is right there with us. Now, this is another reason to have other believers come alongside of us because they can remind us of God's promises and, and they can help us hold on when we feel like giving up. In 2 Chronicles 20, the promise is, if a sword comes against you, that God will deliver us. That we can call out from God's house, I love that, and he will hear and deliver. And so now, uh, the next thing Jehoshaphat does is he moves from the general into the very specific. And he prays, now behold... The sons of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, whom you did not let Israel invade when they came out of the land of Egypt, they turned aside from them and did not destroy them. He's talking to God about the problem. And again, he's very specific. And he he names the problem because Jehoshaphat understands covenant. He understands they belong to God, that God has called them and set them apart as his very own possession. They're there in this covenant together. And so he prays, see how they are rewarding us by coming to drive us out from your possession, which you have given us as an inheritance. Now, in essence, what he's saying is, God, uh, uh, we're yours. And we're fulfilling your will, your divine destiny. They're saying, God, they're mocking you because they're fighting against you because we're yours. And so they're fighting against you, God. Now, uh, what I want you to know, beloved, is that God made you his own in your baptism. That in your baptism, God brought you into a covenant relationship with himself and, and, and made you his very own, put his name in you, and you are his. In fact, God said in 2 Corinthians 6, and I will be a father to you and you will be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. You become God's child and I'm just telling you, you don't mess with God's child. Then he prays, oh, our God, will you not judge them? For we are powerless before this great multitude who are coming against us, nor do we know what to do. But our eyes are on you. Such a great prayer. He's saying, God, God, you've got a problem. We're your children. You've made a promise. And now the enemy is coming. To, and the enemy seeks to steal, kill, and destroy what is yours. And it's just too big for us. We're overwhelmed. And we don't know what to do. But our eyes upon you and God, we can't wait to see what you do. I got to tell you, beloved, I've prayed that many times. Some of the problems and struggles that that come my way, sometimes they're just too big. I don't know what to do. You know, I I try to talk to Sue Steggy, but she doesn't know. So uh, so, uh, uh, that is my prayer. (laughs) For example... For example, I remember when we were trying to get Lovely and Whiskin home. That battle was long and hard, almost four years. And uh, we were there when the earthquake occurred in Haiti. and We had all the paperwork and the visas, all that stuff. And still, everything died. Still, they wouldn't let us bring them home. And this is my prayer. God, I'm in my wit's end. Uh, I, I don't know what to do. But you've made a promise. And uh, uh, you've got a problem, God. Uh, I don't do it. I give it to you. I can't wait to see what you do. And uh, it, make a long story short, God answered in a miraculous way. The very next day, we were able to bring them home. When life is hard and you feel overwhelmed, remember, you are a baptized child of God. You are His. So when the enemy attacks, the enemy seeks to steal, kill, and destroy you, that you are God's, and you're never alone. And when when the enemy attacks you, he attacks God. Never a good choice. Romans 8, Paul said, But in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. So instead of being overwhelmed, we get to overwhelm through Christ. We conquer in Christ. Or, Or Isaiah 54 says, no weapon that is fashioned against you shall succeed, and you shall refute every tongue that rises against you in judgment. 
I could give so many verses that talk about how God fights for us. The, the victory is already ours in Christ. All we need to do is walk in faith. Jehoshaphat said he didn't know what to do, but he turned to the one who did know. He turned to the only one who could handle this big problem. He turned to God. And, and when we go to God in faith, God is always faithful, and he answers. God said in verse 15, listen, all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem and King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you, do not fear, be dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Uh, and and God, God wants to teach the people of his faithfulness, and, and so he has them go to the battle. I, I love this stuff. He wanted them to go out in faith and just trust that he's going to answer. He's going to do the battle for them because he promised. And so this is what God says. You need not fight in this battle. Station yourselves. Stand and see the salvation of the Lord on your behalf. O Judah and Jerusalem, do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow, go out to face them. For the Lord is with you. <laughs> I'm telling you, it's, it's a great faith to believe that God will go out and fight for them. It took great faith and trust in God's promise to stand out there on the battleground in the face of an overwhelming enemy. But they believed. And not only do they believe, they worship. And there's power in worship. Verse 18 says, Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground, and all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell down before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. I, I often say, worship changes everything. When I am at my lowest, worship has the power to lift me up. Worship has the power to change my heart. Worship has the power to change my attitude. Has the power to change my outlook. Because... Worship has the power to change me. And so the next morning, the people go out as God told them. Verse 25, uh, 2. And when they began singing and praising, so they're out there in the battle, and they begin to sing and praise. The Lord set ambushes against the sons of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who had come against Judah so that they were routed. God truly fought for them. He took care of the battle as the people worshiped. There's power in worship. And, and he goes on to say, not one, not one of the enemy escaped. God completely destroyed their enemy, but he didn't stop there. Verse 25. When Jehoshaphat and his people came to take their spoil, they found much among them, including goods, garments, and valuable things which they took for themselves, more than they could carry. And they were Three days taking the spoil because there was so much. God not only gave them the victory without lifting a single weapon, but he blessed them with much spoil as well. Beloved, miracles happen when we worship. One time, uh, Paul and Silas had been arrested for preaching the gospel, and they were put in an inner prison, in an inner dungeon, in chains, in stocks, in the innermost part of the jail. It seemed hopeless. And yet, Acts 16 says, about, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God. And the prisoners were listening to them, and suddenly there came a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison house were shaken and immediately all the doors are open and everyone's chains were unfastened. Beloved, things happen when we worship. Now, uh, the reason we get overwhelmed in life is sin. It could be our own sin causing us to make bad choices uh, and being overwhelmed. It could be other people's sin and the choices they make that are overwhelming us. It could just be that there's sin in the world around us, it impacts our lives. But, but sin, no matter how it comes, sin just tears us up. But God's defeated the power of sin. He took our sin and died on the cross. He died for the sins of the world. And then three days later, rose from the dead to destroy 
destroy the power of sin and death and give us victory, uh, give us life. But he didn't stop there. There's more. In fact, he then filled us with his Holy Spirit. So now when we feel overwhelmed, we know God is with me. And we go to God when we're overwhelmed and know, we know, we know, he's able to do much more than we can think or imagine. That he fights for us. And he has the ability to replace our fear with blessings. So that when the enemy comes to steal, kill, or destroy us, the victory is already won. And, and the thing is, God may or may not remove that inner battle, but he is right there with us in it, giving us peace beyond human understanding. So that Paul can say, we know that for those who love God, all things, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. There is victory in Jesus. To God be the glory for the victory he won for us. Amen. And now may the peace of God that surpasses all our human understanding keep our hearts and minds forever fixed on the author, the victor, the Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.